So welcome back to part two of my Hunchback of Notre Dame Revenge of the Remakes. If you haven't seen part one where I tackled the Salem version and the 1939 version, be sure to check those out first and then come back because even though I'm not talking about them specifically in this review, I will be referencing a few things here and there that those movies did that may have influenced or impacted what Disney did. But for now, let's talk about Disney's take. Revenge of the Remakes. The Hunchback of Notre Dame again. So like I said before, this time I'm going to be talking about Disney's versions of Hunchback of Notre Dame, the 1996 animated feature and the 2014 stage play, both of which have music done by Alan Menken, which is actually kind of rare for Disney Broadway adaptations. Usually they don't bring back the original composer to do the music for the Broadway, or in this case, off-Broadway adaptation. But here they did, and it's an interesting case where Alan Menken really reevaluated his work on Hunchback and he made some tweaks, he added some songs, he took away some songs, and we're going to be talking about that today. But first let's talk about the story of these two versions because even though they're both done by Disney, they both have a fairly distinct story and tone that they're going for. And to start off, the animated version is an interesting case because it's Disney trying to do Hunchback of Notre Dame, which feels like a weird contradiction. You know, the people that brought us Cinderella and Peter Pan and Snow White are taking on this pretty dark story of murder and lust and abuse of power. And for Disney to even try to tackle this subject matter is unusual, but they do it surprisingly well. Really, the best parts of this movie are its darker elements, the stuff with Frollo, the backstory, the hellfire scene, which I will talk about later. But with it being a Disney production, they can't really go all in with this kind of dark gothic atmosphere. They had to balance it out with some slapstick, with some lighter moments, with some comedy. And with something like Hunchback of Notre Dame, it does lend itself to that at times. For instance, the Festival of Fools is a lighter moment and it is welcomed after the very depressing opening sequence where you see Frollo almost drown a baby in a well. Yeah, this movie opens up pretty dark. But then you see Esmeralda and Phoebus and they start bantering and the movie starts to lighten up a bit. And moments like that with Phoebus and Esmeralda where it's character-based humor, those are welcome. But what feels a little weird is the slapstick in this movie because it's very cartoony for lack of a better word even though this is an animated movie here the slapstick and comedy feels a bit too exaggerated and it just takes you out of the moment because it's just kind of goofy and most of this is how the guards are treated they're treated as kind of like buffoons and bumbling idiots and aside from like one or two moments where there's just a bunch of them encircling somebody they don't really come across as that threatening and it makes the greater threat of frollo feel lesser when all of his goons are idiots. And the other element that feels a little too cartoony is the gargoyles. Now I was really thinking about this and it's not Victor or Laverne that get on my nerves. It's really just Hugo played by Jason Alexander. This dude just irritates me. I love him in Seinfeld. I even liked him in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Don't really like him here. He's just too irritating. And his whole personality and line delivery clashes so hard with the tone of the majority of this movie. And my annoyance with this character culminates in the A Guy Like You song, which thankfully got cut and replaced with better songs in the stage version. But yeah, the gargoyles just don't work. And I know there is some debate of whether or not they're in Quasimodo's head or they're actually real enchanted gargoyles. And while I do like the notion that this is just in Quasimodo's head and that he's been secluded for so long, everything starts talking to him, that's not really how the movie presents it. The gargoyles do help out in the final fight at the end, and they also tell Quasimodo things that he wasn't really privy to in the rest of the movie. So my conclusion is that the gargoyles are real and that they're enchanted and it's just stupid. Now the 2014 version, which I'm just gonna call the Broadway version, even though it never made it to Broadway, the recording that I saw took place at the La Jolla Playhouse. 
probably saying that wrong. And it is available on YouTube at the time I'm recording this, so check that out below. It's definitely worth the watch. But the Broadway version is a lot more tonally consistent than the animated version was. They pretty much cut all the goofy antics that take place during the final siege for a more realistic take. For instance, when you see bricks and beams falling down on people, yeah, they're dead. It doesn't just hit them and bounce or hit them and leave an imprint like Tom and Jerry. No, they're, they're dead. Which makes sense because this is a war. It's a siege on Notre Dame. People are gonna die, especially when you have all that molten lead pouring down from the roof. And don't think nobody died in the animated version. I'm sure plenty of people died, but they just didn't show it. In this version, while they don't actually show it, it is more heavily implied that a lot of people died during that. And also the gargoyles are done so much better here. Here they actually are just inside Quasimodo's head talking to him and they don't have an annoying guy like you song that just distracts from the whole plot of the movie. But they serve a couple interesting functions in this story. For one they serve as kind of Quasimodo's moral compass, his conscience, it's the people that he gets advice from for what to do and there is conflicting advice among the gargoyles, but they also serve as a great chorus and talk directly to the audience and kind of fill us in on things that are happening off screen or things that happened before. And for a stage musical, that works really well. Now obviously it wouldn't work as well in other mediums, but for this play, it works and it makes Notre Dame itself feel more like a character and less of a set piece, which was always a crucial element of Victor Hugo's book. But now let's talk about the aspect of both these versions that really makes it stand out among adaptations of Hunchback, and it is Alan Menken's music. Now, Alan Menken didn't do it by himself. He did partner with Stephen Schwartz, but really this is Menken's baby. He was the one that was most in charge in adapting it from animation into a stage play. So I'm gonna be giving him a lot of credit in this video, but just know that Stephen Schwartz also contributed. He was there and it really was a collaborative effort. And the first one that comes up in both versions is The Bells of Notre Dame. Now this song, no matter which version you listen to, is a great song. It's a great introduction to the grandness of the Notre Dame Cathedral itself, as well as introducing us to our main antagonist, Claude Frollo, played in the animated version by Tony Jay and in the Broadway version by Patrick Page. And both these actors do a phenomenal job. They both have amazing voices. They both have that deep, intimidating voice where you can just kind of feel the evil underneath. But it's here where the Broadway version makes an interesting choice in not having Frollo be as diabolical as he was in animated form. Here we see that he had a younger brother, Jean, and they were raised in the cathedral from a very young age, but Jean grew more wild and defied and defiled all the laws of Notre Dame, and he got kicked out, and he went away with a gypsy woman, got her pregnant, had Quasimodo. Jean is on his deathbed, and now Claude needs to take care of this baby that's deformed, but is ultimately his nephew, and he does feel some responsibility. Now in the animated version, we don't really get any backstory on Frollo. We just know that he's a judge as opposed to the archdeacon as he is in the play. But he's still a very pious man. He hates the gypsies. He wants to rid them from Paris completely. And we see him hunt down a few gypsies and kill one of them, a woman on the steps of Notre Dame, and then try to drown her baby after seeing that it's deformed. But then Cogsworth, the archdeacon, stops him from drowning the baby and forces him to take him and raise him as his own. And as for which version I like better, I do like the fact that in the Broadway version, Claude gets a bit more of a backstory. We see his brother, which if you've seen my other video, you know that he's had a brother in the past and they've done it a few different ways. And I also like that Claude Frollo is not just a monster right out of the gate. It's kind of a slow corruption of the mind. The more power that he attains, the more wicked he is to the people that he sees don't deserve kindness. But one thing that really hurts this version for me is the fact that Claude is actually Quasimodo's uncle. And I don't know, there's something about that that I just don't like. It just feels a bit too convenient. I kind of like the simplicity of the original where it's just some random gypsy girl's baby. There's no blood relation. It could really just be anybody's kid. And it feels like more of a sacrifice on Frollo's part to take in a stranger's kid than his own nephew. So really, I don't know which version of Bells of Notre Dame I like better. They both have good and bad, and they just kind of cancel each other out. So we'll call this one a draw, but let's move on to the next big song, which is Out There. That's Quasimodo's I Want song. He wants just 
one day out there among everybody else where he's not cooped up inside. And really there's not a whole lot changed between versions, really only the actor that plays Quasimodo. In the animated version, he's voiced by Tom Hulse, and in the Broadway version, he's played by Michael Arden. And while Tom Hulse does a good job as Quasimodo, he's very likable, he's very kind, and even though he doesn't have the strongest voice, it does fit the character of Quasimodo. Quasimodo is all deformed and misshapen. He's not gonna have a killer voice. It's gonna sound a little shaky and maybe a little weak in parts, and I think Tom Hulse does a good job with that without it feeling too distracting or just really bad. It sounds nice enough, but Michael Arden in the Broadway version just does so much more with the character. He brings such a unique voice to Quasimodo where when he's talking with other people and especially Frollo, he's more hunched over and he mumbles a bit more and he sounds kind of like if Boris Karloff was hard of hearing, so it's not the most pleasant sound to hear. But then when he's singing out there, he starts to come out of the show where he starts standing up a little straighter and his voice does become more of that traditional nice Broadway sound. And at first I didn't like that. I didn't want Quasimodo to have a really awesome belty Broadway voice. But then I started really thinking about it and maybe the musical is trying to say that this isn't so much what everybody hears when he sings, but more of what he hears in his own mind when he sings. It's kind of like the gargoyle situation just with his own voice. And I think that interpretation is fair, but even if you don't buy that, even in his biggest moments, he still has a twinge of that Quasimodo voice still in there. So you never fully lose that sound, which I really appreciated. And full credit to Michael Arden, the superior Quasimodo in my opinion, just because of how he handled the vocal aspect of Quasimodo, which is something pretty tricky to do. And they also brought back the idea that the bells made him deaf. So when he's talking with Esmeralda and Frollo, he's reading the lips and he can hear a little, but he's still mostly deaf like he was in all the previous versions except for the Disney version. And this is another thing that I think holds the Disney version back a little, is that they didn't make Quasimodo deaf. They just made him a hearing person like everybody else, which for the story makes it simpler, but I feel like there is a bit more tragedy that you could play up if you had him be deaf along with just shut in and reclusive and deformed. But now we come to the Festival of Fools, the big opening celebration and really the set piece for most of the first act of this musical. And it's here we're introduced to Esmeralda and Phoebus. And Esmeralda in the anime version is voiced by Demi Moore and in the Broadway version is voiced by Sierra Renee. And both these actresses do a fine job. And I think it's interesting that Disney got Demi Moore right after she was in The Scarlet Letter and right before she was in Striptease. And it is kind of weird that Esmeralda seems to be the perfect transition character in between those two roles. But at the end of the day, I do have to give it to the Broadway version once again for its portrayal of Esmeralda. Now everybody knows the God Help the Outcast song, and it is a great song. It's a very powerful song for Esmeralda's character development. And both versions are good, but Tierra Renee does such a better job, probably because it's her actual voice and not Demi Moore being dubbed. And it just feels a little less passionate than when you actually have someone on stage doing it live, bringing all the emotion and conflict within her out for everybody to experience. And it's just a better version of that song. But the really big difference between these two versions is the song, The Rhythm of the Tambourine, which sadly is not in the animated version, even though it would be perfect for the anime version. There's a sequence where she's dancing and music is playing, so why not have that be a short little musical moment? I don't know. But in the Broadway version, they rectify that with having her sing while she's dancing and performing, and it's just a more engaging experience. And I like how they had Phoebus and Frollo kind of vocalizing how they feel about watching her dance and seeing the difference in perspective between someone who's a lustful party animal versus a lustful priest. But the one thing I'm not 100% on in this song is that they also included Quasimodo in this little segment where the men are looking at her and ogling her. Because I always took it as Quasimodo never really cared how beautiful Esmeralda was. I thought it was more gratitude and appreciation and respect for someone that did a nice thing for him, which hasn't really happened to him before she cut him free and gave him some water after he was being attacked on the pillory. But here they make it a bit more that he's just as infatuated with her physically as the rest of the men. And while it doesn't break the song for me, I just feel like it would have been more simple and more impactful if it was just Phoebus and Frollo talking about her and Quasimodo really 
wasn't in that part. But now let's talk about Phoebus, the sun god, and he is at his best in Disney's hands. He is so much better here than he ever was in any of the other versions because he's given so much more personality here. In the animated version, he's voiced by Kevin Klein, and in the Broadway version, he's voiced by Andrew Samansky. Gosh, these Broadway names are gonna be the death of me. And I'm gonna talk about the Disney version first because he doesn't quite feel like a Disney character. Even the most scoundrelly of Disney characters still have that classic Disney righteousness vibe to them. But here he feels more like a DreamWorks character. He's got that kind of smug sarcasm that DreamWorks is kind of known for with its protagonist. And he is a bit of a scoundrel. He's not as much of a ladies man as he is in the book and previous versions and even in the Broadway version. But he is kind of a troublemaker. He's a rogue and he just kind of does his own thing. Doesn't much care about consequences. That is until he meets Esmeralda and he's infatuated with her and then he starts acting selflessly and starts thinking more of the gypsies and he does become a better person in the end. It's happily ever after with Esmeralda. And as good as this characterization of Phoebus is, it does not hold a candle to how awesome his characterization is in the Broadway version. Now in this version, Phoebus starts out as very much a womanizer. In fact, he has his own song, which is done in instrumental form in the animated version, but here it's a full song called Rest and Recreation, which pretty much encompasses Phoebus' mindset at the start of this movie. He came back from the war, and now he just wants to chill, and he wants to party, and he wants to just earn those checks as being captain of the guard without doing any actual work. But what's weird with Phoebus in this version is that they give him a little moment, a little flashback, to the front during his song. And if you listen to the soundtrack, you can hear that. And it does add an extra layer to Phoebus' psyche when it comes to war, and that he's just seen so much and he wants to just get away from war. So it does show that he's not just a womanizer because he likes women, he's a womanizer because he's trying to cope with the horrors that he saw in the past. Now in the recording that I saw, that's not in there. They cut out that whole flashback segment. So now while he's still the best and most complex version of Phoebus that we have, we don't have that little extra moment where we see where he's coming from and the horrors that he experienced. But what really does it for me in this Phoebus is towards the end when he joins Esmeralda and he basically becomes a gypsy with her. He kind of takes over Gringwire's role because he's not in these Disney versions so somebody has to be with the gypsies and rally the gypsies and be with Esmeralda, but in the end he doesn't live happily ever after with Esmeralda. Esmeralda dies at the end of this play, which is a bold move for this movie, and I think is the only version in all the versions I've talked about where Esmeralda dies. And it's a very touching scene. I do appreciate that they had the guts to kill her off. And while everybody thinks about, oh, how does Quasimodo feel about this, my instinct was to go to how does Phoebus react to this? Because even though he lost the woman that he loved and ultimately made him a better man, where does he go from here? Does he continue with the gypsies? Does he go back into his old ways of drinking and partying? And it's very open-ended. And once again, the point of Notre Dame is not to get full closure with these characters' arcs. It's to appreciate that even though all these things happen, Notre Dame still stands. And Phoebus is just another example of that. But now let's talk about Hellfire. Now this is the one song that I don't think will ever be topped in any version ever. Live action, stage play, animation. It reached its peak with the animated version. And everybody talks about how great Hellfire is. And is it overhyped? Probably. But is it really, really good? Yes. And is it the best Disney villain song ever? Probably, because the intensity just escalates from one to a thousand so fast, but not too fast where you don't understand where Frollo's coming from with this debate that's going on in his head, but still pretty fast where you're like, whoa, dude, like, chill. Like, you're not really about to murder this chick, right? But no, he's definitely gonna murder her. And this whole song is just elevated by one stunning visual after the next. It's just a beautifully animated sequence. And really, the one thing that this movie does have above the Broadway version is the animation. By nature of it being animated, they can do more with the architecture of Notre Dame. The eyes in the very beginning are very powerful. And the epic climax where you see Quasimodo swing down and rescue Esmeralda, and you see the molten lead pouring over the cathedral while the chorus is screaming. This movie has some very striking visuals that unfortunately the Broadway version just can't really compete with. But even though the Broadway version can't compete visually, it does do some interesting things with the characters. It deepens their motivations and relationships, and it adds some new songs that are just 
amazing. Usually when a Disney property gets translated for the stage, they add some songs, and a lot of the songs are just kind of fillery. And if you're lucky, one, maybe two songs really leaves an impact, and you're like, man, I wish that was back in the original. But it's usually not every song. In this Broadway version, every song is amazing. Even the tavern song, which is kind of a trope for Broadway productions, is usually some kind of tavern song, like Master of the House in Les Mis, where it doesn't really further any of the plot, but it's just there to drink and have a good time and kind of boost the energy a little bit. The tavern song in Hunchback is amazing, even though there's two versions of it for some reason. There's the one in the video that is more, let's just jump on the tables and have a drink and have a good time and party, versus the version in the soundtrack, which is a bit more steamy and sexual, where they say, come keep me warm until morning. And it's made very clear what Phoebus and Esmeralda are about to do in that tavern while Frollo looks on. And personally, I prefer the version in the soundtrack. It's a bit more ominous and dangerous, and it deepens the character relationships a bit more. But they're both fun. You have a good time listening to it, and it's good. But I may have lied when I said that they were all great. Because there's one song that, while isn't bad, it's just kind of dumb. And it's Flight into Egypt, which is a song sung by the decapitated Saint Aphrodisius, which is a stained glass window that comes to life and tries to motivate Quasimodo. And while it is definitely a step up from the goofiness of a guy like you, the visual of a decapitated Saint Aphrodisius that kind of becomes normal again is a little goofy and a little gimmicky. And really, I don't know, we haven't really seen any of these surreal visuals before in the play. It's been pretty subtle and grounded up to this point. But really, all that doesn't distract me as much as how much this song reminds me of the theme from Mask of the Phantasm, the Batman movie. Yeah, that's kind of uncanny. But really, the showstopper here is made of stone, which is the big culmination of Quasimodo's angst and frustration during this whole play. And as for where it's placed in the musical, you could see it as a replacement of a guy like you, it's kind of around that same spot. But I really wish they pushed the song to the end of the movie and made it the finale and the last big burst of emotion coming from Quasimodo. Because as great as both versions are, I feel like they never quite got the ending right. The ending to the animated version I think is fine in that they kind of kept everybody alive except for Frollo, who dies in spectacular fashion, by the way. But what undercuts it for me is that Quasimodo gets lifted up by the people of Paris and cheered as a hero and it's just a bit too happy for my taste. Because again, these are the people that turned on him on a dime because he was so ugly and strapped him down to the pillory and started throwing things at him. I don't see them being that happy about him, even if he did say Ferris, because he also was the dude that dropped molten lead onto the people below. And if I were Parisian, I wouldn't be too happy about that. But to contrast that, the Broadway version gets very somber and sad because Esmeralda does die and Phoebus and Quasimodo are just kind of left to mourn her death. And then the Greek chorus comes in and they just kind of wrap up the show for us and reiterate the what makes a monster and what makes a man. And then they do this weird thing where the Greek chorus, who I suspect are the people of Paris, start marking themselves up like Quasimodo. They start deforming and they start making weird hunched over poses as if everyone kind of identifies as Quasimodo. And it's this kind of synergy that happens. It's weird. I don't get it. If you know what they were trying to go for with the ending of this play, let me know in the comments. And maybe I missed something, but from what I could tell, it's just kind of weird and a little out of nowhere, and still tries to make Quasimodo the hero, which was never the point of the book, was never the point of anything. Quasimodo is not the hero, he's the victim. And if you want to have a sad ending, make Quasimodo sad and alone like they did in the 1939 version. And this is why I feel like Made of Stone should have been the final song at the end, because that was Quasimodo's moment to shut out all the voices in his head and just pray to God that he was made of stone. He's done with humanity. He's done with trying to please people. He's done trying to do the right thing. He just wants to be left alone with his bells and have some peace. And the Broadway version undercuts that by immediately having him save Esmeralda right after he sings that song. But if they had saved that until after he saved Esmeralda, after Esmeralda dies and Frollo dies and he's just kind of left alone with Phoebus, 
They could have him kick Phoebus out, and then he sings his really powerful ballad about being made of stone. And maybe through lighting or any kind of effect, have it look like he becomes stone. Again, bringing it back to this kind of living gargle idea that I really liked in the 1939 version, but they don't really do that in this version, and I can't help but see it as a big missed opportunity. But all that being said, which version of Hunchback of Notre Dame do I like the best? It has to be the Broadway version. I've seen this recording a few times over the past couple years, and every time I see it, and then I go back to the Disney version, I can't help but feel like the Disney version is missing some really important beats and moments from the Broadway version to make it as great as it could be. And if I'm feeling that way watching the animated version, the Broadway version just has to be better. But now, the moment that everyone's been waiting for, which version of all the four versions do I like the best? What's the closest to a definitive version of Hunchback of Notre Dame? Well, there is no definitive version. All these versions take such liberties with the books and even liberties among the story with each other that you can really pick your poison. I would say watch all of them and come to your own conclusion as to which one you like the best. But for me, at the end of the day, it's between the 1939 version and the musical Broadway version. And for me, because I am a fan of musicals and the music in Hunchback of Notre Dame is so good and adds so much depth to the story, I would argue the Broadway version is the best Hunchback out there. But if you are not a fan of musicals or musical theater specifically, you might think that this version of Hunchback is a little too weird and out there for you. In that case, I would recommend the 1939 version. I think that is a pretty close second to the Broadway version, just without music. And that does it for my two-part Revenge of the Remakes on Hunchback of Notre Dame. Thank you for sticking with me through all this where I try to rationalize which version of Hunchback I actually like the most. But now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think of Hunchback of Notre Dame? Which version of all the versions, even versions that I haven't even mentioned, do you like the best? Whatever you think, let me know. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk, and I'll see you in the next video.